Hello, everyone. This is the lecture for section 5.1, Sequences. So in the last two chapters of this class, we're going to be studying two things. One of them is going to be really quick, and then we're going to concentrate uh, a whole lot more on the next one. So uh, for the beginning of chapter five, we're going to be studying what's called sequences. Okay, And we're going to use, and it's just going to happen for uh, just one section, we're going to be looking at sequences. The rest of the um, the rest of the course is going to be uh, a study of series, okay? Uh, and uh, series is uh, the summation of stuff. That's what it is, okay? Uh, in order to find out anything about series, we need to first study sequences and uh, start looking at uh, what we can do with those first, because if we can do a fair amount of stuff with the sequences, it actually leads, for, uh, leads us to a couple of conclusions for series when we get there, okay? So for section 5.1, all we're going to do is just sort of define stuff, uh, prep our learning for it, uh, get some definitions down uh, so that we can use it later in series, right? So uh, let's go ahead and get that started first. Okay, so what I want to do is just define uh, what the terminology is for sequences, okay? Um, there's a bunch of stuff that we can use from Calc 1, in particular stuff from uh, limits, okay, um, uh, to help us sort of understand a couple of the things that we're about to do, okay. So the first thing I want to define, right, is the idea of an infinite sequence, and we're going to write them like this, A sub N with the curly brackets around, right? So whenever you have an infinite sequence, right, it's going to be something that looks like this. It's going to be an A1, A2, A3. It's just a big, long list, okay? That N variable is what we call the indexing variable, okay? So basically, we're what the N supposed to serve it as is like it's supposed to be the first value of a, in our sequence, the second value in our sequence, third, fourth, fifth, sixth value in our sequence, so on and so forth, right? Each A sub N, each separate A sub N is what we call a term in the sequence. Okay. Um, sometimes we can get what's called explicit formulas where an A sub N can be defined by a function on that value N. Okay. Um, and in other cases, we can have what's called a recurrence relation uh, where uh, the value for uh, the value in the sequence right, in any part of the sequence is explicitly defined by values that came before it, okay? I'm gonna show you guys a couple of examples, okay? Uh, once we get down to the examples, we're almost there, so. Uh, there are two types of sequences that I want uh, people to sort of know about for now. And if an arithmetic sequence, right, is when the difference between two consecutive terms is constant, okay? And the geometric sequence is when the ratio between a pair of consecutive terms is constant, okay? So the other way to look at it is uh, an, ar an arithmetic sequence, right? Is when you basically add the same amount every time, okay? And then a geometric sequence is when you multiply by the same amount every time, okay? So let me get to some examples, yeah? So let me go to this first one first, right? I'm, I'm giving you guys an arithmetic sequence, right? Uh, first. So it just says write out the first five terms, okay? And the sequence that we have is this one right here. A sub n is 2 minus 2 to the n, and it starts from 0, goes to infinity, right? So I'm going to go ahead and do uh, A sub 0 first, right? That is going to be 2 times, oh, whoops, 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 2 minus 2 times 0. That is going to be It is that simple, right? A1, right? 2 minus 2 times 1, 0. A2, 2 minus 2 times 2, minus 2. A3, right? 2 minus 2 times 3, that's going to be minus 6 plus 2. That's going to be minus 4, right? A to the fourth. 2 minus 2 times 4. Hopefully you guys see what 
that's why we call it an indexing variable, right? So this is going to be the uh, the fourth term, right, in our sequence. Uh, eight, so two minus eight minus six. Hopefully you guys see a pattern here. A to the uh, A sub five is going to be negative eight. A sub six, negative 10, dot, dot, dot. So our sequence, A sub N is two, zero, negative two, negative four, negative six, negative eight, negative 10, dot, 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 dot. So notice how this is an arithmetic sequence. Excuse me. This is an arithmetic sequence. Uh, I am adding the same amount. Well, in this case, I'm subtracting the same amount, right? So I'm adding negative two or subtracting two every time. That simple. Okay. Okay. Next one. So this one's a geometric series. So this one, like I said, it looks like we're going to be multiplying the same amounts every time, right? So let's start with a sub zero, because it starts at zero, right? Uh, three over four to the zero power, anything to the zero power is going to be one. A to the a sub one, three over four to the one, that is just three over four. A sub two, three divided by four uh, squared, so nine over 16, if you uh, so reduce it down right. A cubed, uh, three over four cubed. So it's gonna be uh, 27 over 64, right? Uh, a to the fourth, is going uh, a sub four a sub four sorry uh three over four to the fourth right so that right there is going to be 81 divided by 256 so our sequence a sub n is going to be uh whoops i did it wrong did it wrong a sub n is going to be this collection of numbers right here one three fourths Nine sixteenths, uh, twenty seven sixty fourth, comma, dot, 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 dot. Okay. Awesome. Next one. So here we have the an example of a recurrence relation. Okay. So notice how this is being defined that a sub n is being defined by a sub n minus one and a sub n minus two. Got it? So it's being defined by two values that came before it. That's why we call it a recurrence relation, okay? Uh, whenever something like this happens, it's, it's a recurrence relation. So uh, since, it's, since the nth term is being defined by the two that came before it, we have to sort of start somewhere, right? So these are just plainly assigned. We, I'm just saying that a sub zero is equal to zero and a sub one is equal to two, or sorry, one, right? We just have to start with that, okay? So then that means the very first one, right? So let's, let's go ahead and let me write some of these things out. So a sub zero is zero because that's where it started at, right? a sub one is one. A sub two is going to be the first one that's going to be defined by our recurrence relation. Okay. So in order to do that, right, in order for us to do A2, it's just going to be the two numbers that came before it and added them together, right? So it's going to be one plus zero is one. A sub two, or whoops, whoops, A sub three, Right, it's supposed to be the two before it, so it's this in this case, it's going to be one plus one. This is two. Okay, uh, a sub four, it's the two that came before it added up, so it's going to be two plus one, three. A sub five is the two get, that came before it, so three plus two is five. A sub six is five plus three, that is eight. A sub seven 
is these two added up, so that's uh, eight plus five, 13, right? So our sequence is this set of numbers right here, zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, dot, 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 dot. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what we define it, uh, as a recurrence relation. Now, this recurrence relation has a very nice name. If you guys uh, have ever sort of seen this collection of numbers, it's got, uh, a pretty hardy uh, uh, history. It's called the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, this French dude Fibonacci or Italian dude Fibonacci, he looked at uh, the growth of rabbits. And from the growth of rabbits, he noticed that they went in a pattern. And this is the pattern. That's why it's called the Fibonacci sequence. And it turns out that this Fibonacci sequence, this list of numbers, has a bunch of other pretty wild, um, has an, a, a bunch of other pretty wild uh, uh, conclusions uh, and a lot of smaller, you know, and pretty major curiosities uh, that also appear in just the natural sciences. So some of the things that you maybe might hear about is um, the, the number of, you know, the number of seeds in a pine cone, right? They tend to fall under uh, the Fibonacci sequence kind of random, right? You think like, wh why would pine cones no math? But they do. Um, uh, what's another one? Um, perfect proportions tend to follow the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, and that goes for like the human body, right? Uh, that goes for certain uh, animal characteristics. A bunch of stuff is explained by this Fibonacci sequence. So if you guys wanna read into it a little more, it's there for the taking, cool? All right, let me go to one more, okay? Uh, and like I said, uh, the, 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 the previous sequence is the interesting one. This one has its own curiosity itself. And, and let me go ahead and just start computing stuff out, yeah? So first of all, uh, I want everybody to see this, n equals zero to infinity, right? Now, I'm gonna compute the first one. Hopefully you guys see the problem here a sub zero, right, is going to be negative one to the zero, 100, one minus one over zero to the zero power, right? This is a does not exist. So even though it says n equals zero, right, the very first term does not exist. So this, and the, you guys are probably like, well, why'd you write it? It's by design, bro. It's by design. It's supposed to be uh, n equal one. So if you just go based off of the definition of a sub n, right? And if something doesn't exist like this thing right here, right? Um, the math will work itself out and you're gonna end up catching it at the end anyway. So, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to just compute values out just like I'm doing here, right? Nothing bad with it. Okay, it's what it'll work. It'll work itself out. It'll show you, you know, the mistake that happens if something happens. Okay, so this is supposed to actually start at one. So a one, negative one, right to the one. Let me get my math right. There we go. One hundred one minus one over one to the one power. Okay, that's gonna be, I'm gonna do it actually right below it, negative one times 100 to the zero, times zero to the one power. This is zero. I'll put that in parentheses there, All right? Okay, so I'm gonna start highlighting some of these just to keep track of them. So that's A1, let's do A2. Negative one squared, 100, one half, squared. Well, let me actually write it all out, right? One minus one half squared. Whoops, squared. That thing right there, right? So this is going to be negative one 
squared, I'm gonna just go ahead and change that to just one, right? 100 times one fourth, 25. Let me highlight the DNA while we're, while we're at it, yeah? Uh, A3. Negative one cubed, 100, one minus one third to the third. So negative one cubed, that's gonna be a minus one, and it's gonna be 100 times two thirds cubed. And if you do this right, you get negative 29.62 nine repeated. Let's do a four, uh, a sub four, negative one to the fourth, 100, one minus one fourth, right to the fourth. So negative one to the fourth, that is a positive one. So I'm just gonna write the positive one, even though it's, I'm just putting it down just so that I know I handled it, right? 100, one minus a fourth, that's gonna be three fourths to the fourth. And that reduces down to 31.6406. I'm gonna highlight that one, okay? Let's do one more right here. Actually, let me move it up here. A to the fifth, right? Negative one to the fifth, 100, one minus one fifth to the fifth power. Negative one to the fifth. So let me go ahead and do the negative one to the fifth already. So negative one to the fifth, that is gonna be just negative one, right? 100, one minus one fifth, that's four over five to the fifth. And that is equal to negative 32, Point seven six eight, and I'm gonna highlight that one too. So what I wanna do is this. I want you guys to notice something. So my A sub n, my sequence here, right, sub n is equal to zero, 25, negative 29.629, 31.6, 406, negative 32.768, dot, dot, dot. Now I should put a dot, dot, dot there. Now I want you guys to notice something, right? The first two are cool, right? Let me use blue. The first two, you know, the math worked out okay, right? Let me actually use pink. The first two, they started out cool, right? But then the next one was negative. And then what followed was positive. And then I got a negative. And what's gonna end up happening is the next one is gonna be a positive. And then after that one is gonna be a negative and a positive and a negative, okay? So hopefully you see what you got, what, well, you know, what the numbers are telling us, we have something that jumps back and forth between a positive and a negative, right? Uh, we'll get to study these later on in the semester, uh, later on in, in this month. Um, this is what's called an alternating series. And hopefully you guys see what's, what's the culprit uh, that's making us oscillate back and forth between a positive and a negative, positive and negative, positive and negative, right? Our culprit is this thing right here. It's the negative one to the n, okay? So uh, I, I wanted to do this example so that you guys can see uh, sort of what, what an oscillating sequence does. And this is one of the telltale signs. Like if you look at a sequence and you see something that looks like this, negative one to the n, you know that it's gonna be jumping back and forth. You know that it's going to be jumping back and forth between positive and negative. So, just keep this one in the back pocket. You know, keep this one, uh, you know, hidden away somewhere. Somewhere you can reach for it in a little bit once we start seeing many, many more oscillating things. Okay. Uh, now, 
This is one of the culprits. There's many more. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to start you guys off on just seeing and recognizing what an oscillating sequence is going to look like. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and move to limits of a sequence. So um, we know how a sequence is defined, right? Uh, we've done a couple of them already, right above, okay? Um, well, one of the questions that come up when you look at sequences, right, is, well, I only did, you know, the first five, the first 10, the first 15 terms of my sequence. What happens if I just let that n just blow up, just let it go off to infinity, right? And that is the study of finding the limit of a sequence, right? Um, a lot of the stuff that we need for sequences, right, to determine the behaviors of a sequence, right, is actually stuff from like the first or second week of Calc 1, okay? So let me give some definitions for that really quick, right? So suppose we had a sequence, right? Uh, we say that our, our terms, a sub n, right, if they get arbitrarily close to some finite number l as n becomes sufficiently large. So basically saying, right, what that basically says is as I let n become super big, right, if I let n become super big, right, and it just starts getting closer and closer and closer and closer to a value l, right, then we say that a sequence, a sub n, is the convergent sequence to l. Right, and that L value is the limit of the sequence, okay? So if that happens, right, we end up writing this thing. The limit as N goes to infinity of A sub N is equal to L, okay? So basically saying if, if we just let our N just completely take off, completely blow up, right? And our A sub N values start getting closer and closer to a value L, right? Then we're saying that our sequence, the terms in our sequence are converging to a value L, okay? If it does not converge, right? If it does not converge, so if we let N just completely blow up, right? A million, a gajillion, a whatever zillion, right? Uh, if N becomes infinitely large, right? But it doesn't get close to anything, right? If it does not converge to a fixed value L, then we say we have a divergent sequence. We say that we have a divergent sequence. Okay? So what I want to do now is I want to determine the behavior of these sequences. So basically asking, uh, is my sequence uh, diverging or converging? Okay? So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and split this screen in half because I want to do something on Desmos, okay? And just let me make sure. Yep, okay, we're set. <clears throat> so what I want you guys to do is, uh, if you can, follow along on Desmos, right? I'm going to go ahead and do stuff on Desmos. I'm going to show you guys how to do some of the behaviors. Uh, excuse me. Um, I'm gonna show you guys how to figure out behaviors for um, for these sequences using Desmos, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up Desmos appropriately, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say this, uh, uh, f of x, I'm gonna do the first one, right? Is gonna be equal to, let me move my cursor out of the way, two minus two, x, right? And for now, it's showing up as a line, right? But now this is what I want you to do. I want to go to this plus sign that's right here. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to go to table. And you guys see, hopefully, that this table pops up. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that sub one that's there, right? It's going to complain for a little bit. But over here, for the y one, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to go f of x. Okay, and the second we do this, what we're doing is we're setting up a table that will take in X values and pop out uh, the Y values corresponding to uh, the function that's above it, 
right? And in this case, I changed that function to the equation for my sequence, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and do zero, one, whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 10, and um, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now, you can take this as far as you need to. And I'm, what I'm gonna do now, actually, is I'm going to turn off the function itself. So I want just the dot, okay? I just want the dots, that's it, okay? So here we go. These values right here, these dots represent uh, the sequence uh, that we're looking at, the a sub n equal two minus two to the n, right? So now the question becomes, looking at the sequence, do we have something that diverges or do we have something that converges? So in this case, right, notice what, what's happening to my y values here, right? My f of x values, the, the values of my sequence, right? They just shoot downward. It looks like it's gonna just keep going, right? It doesn't look like I can go far out enough Right? It doesn't look like I'm going to be able to go far out enough and have my uh, sequence start getting closer and closer to a specific value. Does that make sense? As I go far out, my sequence is not getting any closer to a specific value. So what we can say here for this uh, particular sequence is that our sequence diverges. It doesn't converge to a specific value, right? So. Just to show you guys what I'm talking about, right? Just to catalog what I just said, I'm gonna grab that right there, okay? And I'm gonna unfortunately have to paste it off screen. And let me whoosh, just rush this a little bit. And yeah, not completely rush it, but whoosh, there we go. And now I'm gonna get in really close again. So there we go. And where did I leave my pen? There it is, okay. So I'm gonna write over here, right? The a sub n values they don't converge to a value L, right? So therefore we can say my sequence a sub n diverges, okay? Okay, awesome. Let's move on. Let's do the, the, the top one, three divided by four to the n, n equals zero, right? Okay, so let's go, now I'm getting confused here. Oh, there it is. Let me minimize that. I'm gonna go ahead and change my function. That's really all I need to do, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and do three divided by four, 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 to the x, right? So what we have here, right, is the values of my sequence, right? So this, if you guys remember, right, this is one, this is three fourths, this is, 916th, this is 2781st, right? So on and so forth, right? And notice what's happening here. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a little bit on my sequence. Come on, there we go. Okay, so uh, one is the first one, 0.75 is the second, uh, 0.5625 is the third, Four, fifth, six, seventh, eight, nine, 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 right? Okay. Now, what I want everybody to notice is what's happening to my blue dots on the uh, right hand side of the screen. They are dropping, right? And if I keep going, so let me go ahead and do, I stopped at 15. Let me keep going down to 16, 17, 18, 19. Let's do 20, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and scrunch this up even more. You guys see that our sequence, right? It's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, and it's dropping less and less every time, but it looks like it's gonna be hugging a specific value, right? 
it looks like it's going to hug a specific value. And that particular value in this case is zero, right? So since it is converging, it looks like it's like, it's, it's dropping, it's dropping, but it doesn't want to drop anywhere below zero, right? And it's getting closer and closer and closer to that value. That's what that limiting value is for, right? So uh, what we have here, I'm going to go ahead and catalog that. I'm going to go ahead and do uh, whoosh, like this. Okay, so when you're messing around on Desmos, right? If you need to, you can take screenshots for these couple of problems like this. Um, oh, come on. No, don't do that. Don't do that. My computer decided to, okay, there we go. Never mind. I take it back. Okay. So if we take a look at the, the direction of our Y values, right? The direction of our dots, they are hugging that Y equals zero, right? So uh, here we would say, right? that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to zero, okay? Our values are converging to, a val to the value zero, okay? So this one converges. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Let's do this one. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so for this one, right, if you guys take a look, right, uh, this is a recurrence relation. Unfortunately, this is going to happen sometimes where I'm going to uh, give you a sequence, right? Or you're going to, you know, run across a sequence and there is no explicit function for it that uh, is defined by uh, some form of formula, right? Um, that's the point behind recurrence relations. It's defined by previous numbers, right? So if you don't have a formula for those previous numbers, you can't find the formula for the next one, unless you refer to the previous values, right? In that case, right, I'm just going to go ahead and delete these two, right? I can still go ahead and stick in a table, right? And I'm going to call it x1. I'm just going to leave it there, right? And I'm going to go uh, 0 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay? Now, we know the first one is zero and the next one is one, right? Uh, the next one after that is supposed to be the addition of the ones of the two before, right? So that uh, for a sub two, it's supposed to be one. For this one's supposed to be two. This one's gonna, gonna be three. This one's going to be five. This one's going to be eight. This one's going to be 13, right? This one's going to be, uh, what is that, 21? This one's going to be 34, 34. This one's going to be 55, so on and so forth. So I don't need to go too far, right? So I'm going to delete these other ones. Delete, 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 delete. Okay. So I have my X and Y points sort of plotted out. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom out so you guys can see what's happening to my points. Right? There we are. Okay. So the question is, right, what are my uh, points doing? What is, what is the direction of my A sub N? Right? And if you take a look at these, right? They just tend to just keep climbing. They keep climbing, they keep climbing, climbing and climbing and climbing. So what we have here, again, is one of those divergent sequences, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing. I'm gonna catalog this, I'm gonna snip that. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so I can paste it somewhere here, paste. And I'm gonna make it nice and tiny so that it falls nicely in there. Come on. There we go. So uh, in this case, right, a sub n values. Uh, 
So my a sub n values here, they also diverge. Since it's not getting closer and closer and closer to a particular value, as my n's sort of blow up to infinity, right? I can just quietly say they diverge, okay? Okay, next one. So remember, we we did, uh, we wrote out some of the values for the sequence, right? Right before this, and this one was our oscillating one, right? So I'm gonna get rid of it and I'm gonna go ahead and do my f of x again. I'm gonna write out my, my formula, right? Negative one, this one has a formula. So the x, 100, one minus one divided by x, I'm going to close that one off to the x. And is it talking about f? Yeah, I need to put an equal sign in between. There we go. OK, so let me go ahead and I don't know why it's not. Oh, that's fine. Let's go here. Let me go to table, right? I'm going to get rid of my x my s x of one, I don't need the one, but I do need this one to be f of x, right? And I'm gonna turn off the function itself. I just want the dots, so I'm gonna leave the, the red in the table. I'm just gonna go ahead and start filling this in. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay. So notice, remember how I said, right, this, this uh, sequence, it was jumping back and forth between a positive and a negative value, right? And so look at what happened here, right? Uh, there's one value that landed smack dab on the x-axis, right? But then after that, it went positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, so on and so forth, right? And if you notice, our sequence reflects that. So it goes positive, negative, uh, po uh, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, right? So uh, again, now to, to determine the behavior, right? I'm gonna go ahead and snip this. To determine the behavior, we want to determine if this thing is converging or diverging. So we have to go back to our definition itself, right? Are the X values getting closer to a specific one uh, Y value, right? Are my values getting closer and closer to one particular value? And the answer here is no, they are not. They're getting closer to two values, right? But the definition for convergence is that it gets closer and closer to one, only one value, right? Two doesn't count. It has to be one, right? So my a sub n, right? Let me actually do it this way. a sub n terms. Approach, APP. That's supposed to be a U, U. There we go. The A sub n terms approach two different values, right? The positive one, the positive one goes to a specific value, and the negative one goes to another value, right? But the definition of convergent is that it converges to one value. It can't be two, it has to be exactly one. So that means this sequence, my A sub n here. Right, diverges. Okay, so this is how we're going to be using Desmos. This is how I hope you guys use Desmos for answering some of these questions. Um, and for now, we're using Desmos to give us a like. I'm I'm going I'm perfectly uh, happy with you guys using Desmos to give me sort of a inkling of whatever the gut feeling is for some of these sequences, right? Uh, later in the semester, 
uh, we'll learn how to actually prove convergence and divergence outright, right? Without using pictures, okay? Uh, but for now, for now, right? Just to get you some sort of direction, just to get you some sort of gut feeling for what the behavior of these sequences are, right? Use Desmos, use Desmos, okay? So we've got some answers here. This one diverges, this one converges, this one diverges, and this one diverges. So only one of the four converged, okay? So uh, that brings me to your first quick check. Uh, I want you guys to write out uh, the first five terms for each one of these, right? And use Desmos to determine uh, whether or not you have something that is convergent or divergent. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, moving on, I have to put this in here. Um, if you take a look at your textbook, there is a very, very, very rigorous way of determining the limit of a sequence. Okay. And that argument is requiring uh, stuff with uh, the letter epsilon. Okay. Now, I needed to take a drink of water. My throat felt a little dry. So thankfully for everyone in here, right, this Calc 2 course is supposed to be for all STEM majors, not just for the mathematicians. So uh, if you want to know how to rigorously, like really bona fide mathematically show um, what the limit of a sequence really is, right? Then you're gonna to have to go through what's called the epsilon delta argument. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and skip that, okay? Uh, for now, right, graphing and writing out terms and providing guesstimations, sort of approximations, your gut feeling uh, for the limit of a sequence is good enough for now, okay? Um, I think this epsilon del delta argument that's in your textbook, uh, I would more than likely say, right, uh, if you are going to study mathematics for the rest of your life, aka if you're going to be a mathematician, then you would need to know how to do it, right? For everybody else, you don't need to. So um, if you do want to find out what it is, though, go to chapter five. It's in the book. Cool. Uh, so now let's go ahead and move to the limit of a sequence defined by a function, okay? And we've already been sort of doing this. This is the point behind what we've been doing on uh, Desmos, right? So if you have a limit, if you have a sequence, right, that is defined by a function, f of n, right, for all n greater than 1. And if you have the limit as x approaches infinity being l, right, and l is that real number, then a sub n, the sequence converges, and we say this, right? It's essentially what we were doing in the section before, that um, if we can basically write our sequence as a function, and that function converges, then the sequence converges. That's basically it, right? And like I said, that's what we were doing in Desmos, right? We were, without me telling you, right, we were turning our sequence into a function and that function either diverged or converged, right? Depending on its behavior. And that's all this stuff right here. That's us looking at dots, okay? Okay, uh, again, quick check. Try these out, right? Determine the behavior of the following sequence, write out the solution using the correct notation. So if this function diverges or converges, right? Tell me it diverged and give me the argument why. And if this one diverged or converged, right, give me the argument and write out the proper notation. Got it? Okay. Moving on. There's a fair amount of, let me actually scroll up to these two. There's a fair amount of uh, stuff from Calc 1 that is sort of reusable here. Okay. In particular, when we have a, a geometric series of some sort, so some a sub n equaling some r to the n, right? 
there were some things from calc one that we did with these kinds of uh, functions, right? That automatically held true whenever we use them, right? So the first, the, the, the table that we have here, right? Sort of summarizes all of that. If your R is anywhere between zero and one, excluding one, right? Okay. And you let N go to infinity, right? then that a sub n, all of the values, the terms, as you get farther and farther out, will end up going to zero, okay? If your r is equal to one, exactly equal to one, right? Then your sequence should be one. And if your r is strictly big, bigger than one, right? Then your a sub n's go to infinity, in which case you have something that's divergent. Okay, so automatically when you look at the quick checks above, you should be able to take uh, take a look at them and say which one is divergent and which one is convergent. Okay, I'm not going to give it away. I want you guys to try your argument out. Okay, okay. Uh, like I've been mentioning a lot uh, in this section just now for this, you know, these three pages that we've done, right? Uh, a lot of the stuff from Calc 1 still works here. Okay, so suppose you had a sequence a n and a sequence b n, right? And c is any random number that's not equal to zero, right? Okay, if there exists a big A and a big B such that uh, a sub n converge to a and b sub n converge to b, then the following rules still apply, right? So the limit of a constant number is still a constant number, right? Uh, this one, the next one down is a multiplicative rule, right? If you have C times the sequence, that's the same thing as just pulling out the C, right? And just doing the sequence, right? So the C popped out of the limit and it's equal to C times the limiting number, whatever that is, right? Okay, the next one. If you have the addition of sequences because of limits, right, you can split the limit over each one and do either the sum or the difference, whichever one you had. Okay. If you have the product of sequences, right, then you can split them up under the limit uh, of the products. Oh, sorry, the product of the limits, bleh, right? This is assuming that the two limits exist, okay? And then the last one, right? If you have the division of sequences, an a n divided by b n, right? Then it's going to be the division of their limits, which is the division of their uh, convergent numbers, right? Assuming that b is not equal to zero and each one of the bn's is not equal to zero. If you have a bn equaling zero, then you're dividing by zero at one point in the sequence, you can't have it. Okay. So all of this stuff, right, still works uh, from calculus one. So all the stuff that we learned from calculus one still works here. Let me show you what I'm talking about here, okay? Uh, I am now going to provide sort of semi nearly formal arguments for determining whether or not a sequence converges or diverges, right? If it does converge, I'm gonna provide its limit. And if it doesn't converge, right, I'm just gonna say it's divergent. I'm gonna give the argument for why. Got it? Okay, so uh, let's take this first one. We know from the previous uh, example that this diverges, right? So the idea, right, is I need to find the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, right? This is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity, let me get my notes up, there we go, of 2 minus 2n, right? Uh, because of the rules from above, right, I can split up this thing into the limit as n goes to infinity of two minus the limit as n goes to infinity 
of 2n. I can actually pop this 2 out, but I don't need to. And here's the reason why. The limit as n approaches infinity of 2, that is just 2, minus the limit as n approaches infinity of 2n, right? Uh, since the n's go into infinity, the 2n's going to go to infinity. There's a negative, so it's going to go to the minus infinity, right? And that is just minus infinity, right? Since it doesn't approach something in particular, right? It doesn't approach a, a specific value, right? This is why we're able to say this is the nearly formal argument for a sub n, in this case, being divergent. Cool? All right. Let's keep going. So a sub n is equal to this nasty thing right here. We've got a fraction going on here, right? So that means I need to still find the same thing, right? Limit as n goes to infinity of my a sub n. That is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n squared plus 50n divided by 5n squared plus 30, OK? Now, hopefully you guys remember the argument for how to solve something like this. We had to divide the top and the bottom by a specific factor, right? And I, depending on how your Calc 1 instructor showed you, right, uh, some instructors say take uh, uh, divide by the biggest power that you see. Some people say divide by the biggest power that's on the bottom specifically. Let's go ahead and do that one in particular. I'm going to divide everything by the biggest power on the bottom, since that's how I did it in my Calc 1 class. So limit n goes to infinity, right? I'm going to do 3n squared plus 50n divided by, hopefully you guys remember it when you see it, uh, divided by n squared divided by 5n squared plus 30 divided by n. Hopefully you guys see that. Oh, sorry, n squared on the bottom. Oop, almost forgot. All right. So now this reduces to limits as n goes to infinity of 3, well, 3, plus 50 over n divided by 5 plus 30 over n squared. Hopefully you guys remember that argument, right? And now what ended up happening was this. Both of these are the things that still have the n in it, right? And our n is going to infinity, right? Since n is in the denominator, and the n is going to infinity, right? It's going to be 50 divided by a really massive number. That thing goes to 0, right? And likewise, with this thing down below, the 30 divided by n squared, right? The n is going to infinity. And then the n's are being squared. And then we're doing 30 divided by the n squared. This also goes to 0. So this reduces down to just 3 over 5. Right. So then we say, right, a sub n converges to two to three over five. Cool. Let's move down to the very last one for this section, boom. So just keep in mind, right? Anything that you learned in Calc 1 that'll help you prove either convergence or divergence uh, in this section, right, is fair game. Okay, so again, I'm gonna go ahead and do an LN, or sorry, a limit as n goes to infinity of n over two squared times e to the minus n, right? I'm gonna go ahead and do the square here. We're gonna be the limit 
as n goes to infinity of n squared over four times e to the negative n, that's one over e to the n. If you don't remember that, that's your pre-calc. Go back, check your notes. Limit as n goes to infinity, infinity, right? Of n squared divided by four e to the n. Now, some of you guys are probably thinking, I have no idea how to do this. Yes, you do. You just don't remember it. Watch me do this, right? Uh, actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go equal. If I plug in infinity to both of these, right, I'm going to get an infinity over infinity, right? That means I can use L'Hopital's. Right? So then this is equal to, right, the limit as n goes to infinity, the derivative of the top n squared, that's going to be 2n. The derivative of the bottom, that's 4e to the n, right? And guess what? If I plug in uh, infinity for n everywhere, I still get infinity over infinity. This is an indeterminate form. So I can use L'Hopital again. Okay. And then this is equal to the limit as n goes to 0 of the derivative of the top, that's going to be 2. The derivative of the bottom is 4e to the n. That's supposed to be n goes to infinity, right? Now I don't have an indeterminate form anymore, right? So it's going to be 2 divided by 4e to the n. My n goes into uh, to the e to the n, right? My infinity goes into the e to the n. As n gets bigger and bigger, e to the n gets bigger and bigger, right? And then I'm doing two divided by a bigger and bigger and bigger number, right? So that this right here, specifically what we say is this, right, goes to infinity, right? Which means infinity, come on, there we go. Which means all of this, this whole limit goes to zero. So my, my sequence, a sub n, right, converges to zero. So I'll leave it to you all to try this out, to give you guys some practice in terms of just using Desmos appropriately, right? If you plug in at least the first one, we already did it, right? The second one, if you plug this in using the method that I used in Desmos, right, uh, and you look at the dots, it'll show you that it's gonna converge to three fifths, okay? And then likewise, for this last one, right, if you put this into your function and, uh, you know, let uh, compute out a, a couple values up to maybe 15 to 20, 25, right? You'll see that the values there are gonna converge to zero, okay? Awesome, sounds good, okay. Quick check. Try the arguments out, right? So you can do all of these by L'Hopital's if you wanted to, but try out the divided, try out the dividing by the biggest term from the bottom. See how that works out, okay? Uh, no matter what, you can grab these uh, sequences, right? And plug them into Desmos and just get yourself like a, a gut feeling of what they're supposed to do. Okay, uh, should they converge, should they not converge, should they diverge, what do they converge to? If that's the case, if they do converge, you know what they converge, to, you know what value they're supposed to converge to, right? So you should know what the limit's supposed to be, right? And then try to reverse engineer it that way, okay? Awesome. Okay. Let me move on. Like I said, there's a fair amount of stuff from Calc 1 that sort of uh, pops up again when we're doing this uh, sequence, uh, this this uh, this section right here. Uh, one of the things that pops up again is the squeeze theorem. So if you guys remember the squeeze theorems for functions, right, there is a squeeze theorem for sequences. Okay, so uh, I like pictures, if you guys haven't noticed. So I'm going to draw pictures here. So here is my 
x. I'm going to do it again for, well, x and y. The first one was my y. This one's my x. So now, let's say this is, in this case, I'm going to have n, right? And on my y, I'm going to have my a sub x, right? OK. Let's get started here. Let's say you had an a n, a b n, and a c n. So you had three different sequences, right? And suppose that for uh, a particular big n value, right, there exists a particular big n value such that this order is maintained. OK, AKA, the other way to read this is your B of n, right, is squished between A sub n and C sub n for any number bigger than n, OK? OK, if the outside two sequences, right, if the top sequence and the bottom sequence converge to a value L, right, then that forces uh, B sub n, the middle sequence, to also converge, right? So this is what this is basically saying, right? So uh, let me do the green one. The green one's gonna be the top one. So let's say my sequence does, right? There we go. So that's my A sub n, right? Uh, let's say we had another sequence from below. right? And this is my C sub n, right? Then, and then we had the sequence in the middle, right? So dot, 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 dot. Hopefully you guys see what's going on. Here is my L value, right? Since this set of sequences, the a sub n converges to L and the bottom one also converges to L, right? Then this middle one has to converge to L as well. It's basically getting squeezed from above and below, okay? Okay. Um, one of the uh, sequences or one of the theorems that we have uh, that is fairly useful in uh, determining convergence or divergence for uh, oscillating terms, okay? That's the one, that, remember how I mentioned it, the ones that jumped from positive to negative to positive to negative to positive to negative, right? This is one of the big theorems that we use uh, to handle sequences that do that, okay? Uh, it's not the best one, right? For now, that this is the one that we got, okay? But if the absolute value of our sequence a sub n. If the limit of the absolute value is equal to zero, then the limit of the original one is equal to zero. Okay, so now let me go ahead and show you guys what I'm talking about. I have another sequence here, okay? Uh, we don't know if it converges or diverges, but if it does converge, give me the limit, okay? Let's go ahead and just start by writing out some uh, values, okay? So let's start with a sub zero, right? Sine two times zero, whoa, zero plus one pi divided by two times ln of zero plus one over zero. Guess what? You guys remember when I said the math sort of takes care of itself? I'm dividing by zero in there, right? So I can't do that one. So a sub zero is not the very first term. We have to move to a sub one. Sine two, one plus one pi divided by two times ln one plus one over one. This is negative ln of two. So uh, two 
times one, that is two, plus one, that's three. So this thing right here, do it in pink, that right there is gonna end up being three pi over two. Sine of three pi over two is negative one, if you remember your unit circle, right? Okay. So let me go ahead and highlight some of the green values here. Boom. Cool. A2. Sine 2 times 2 plus 1 pi over 2 times the ln of 2 plus 1 over 2 ln of 3 halves. Let's highlight that. Cool. Now, I want to, again, I'm, I'm going to highlight this right here. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 is 5. So that's going to be 5 pi over 2, right? 5 pi over 2, the sine of 5 pi over 2 is positive 1. So that's why the positive is still there, right? Okay. A sub 3. Sine 2, 3 plus 1 pi divided by 2 times ln 3 plus 1 divided by 3, negative ln of 4 over 3. Okay, so let me highlight a final for this one, right? And again, notice that thing in the inside, right, is going to be 2 times 3, that's 6 plus 1, 7. So it's going to be 7 pi divided by 2. The sine of 7 pi divided by 2 is negative 1. So that's where the negative comes from. Check your unit circle if you don't recall, right? Uh, A sub 4. Oh, man. Let me take a sip of water really quick. My throat feels a little dry. Mm. Thank goodness it's getting warmer. Stay hydrated. Okay. Let's keep going. So sine three, oh, not three, sorry, two times four plus one pi divided by two times ln. That's going to be four plus one over four. Positive ln of uh, five over four ln. Oops. Boom. I'm going to highlight it again just to sort of hook it in a little bit, a little more, right? So 4 times 2, that's 8 plus 1, that's 9. So that thing in the pink, the very last thing in the pink there is 9 pi over 2. The sine of 9 pi over 2 is positive 1. There we are, right? So that means that our sequence is doing this, right? Hopefully you guys see the pattern happening, right? And I'm gonna keep the first one, I'm gonna sort of maintain the, the sort of like the pattern, right? So negative ln of two over one, a positive ln three over two, a negative ln three over, oops, four over three, sorry, four over three ln of five over four. The next one, hopefully you guys see this already, is gonna be negative ln six over five. Six over five, whoops. Six over five. Then it's gonna be positive ln seven over six, dot, 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 dot. So if you keep going, you get the, you get that, right? Okay, now what I want to do now is I want to jump back over to Desmos, Desmos, and I'm going to go ahead and delete all of that. I'm going to actually make it a little bigger here so I can just go ahead and delete the entire thing. And what I want to do, right, is I'm going to type this in, sine of uh, 2x, let me 
put that in parentheses, plus one. Close that off, pi divided by two, right? Times ln of x plus one divided by, whoops. Oh, I forgot to put it in parentheses. X plus one divided by X. There we are. So, and what I want to do is I need to put this in, oh, it's already in radians. We're good, we're good, we're good. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and Mm, oh, it's not supposed to be plus there, it's supposed to be times. There we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, so notice what's happening, right? Our values do oscillate. So the first one's down here. So one is down here, two is down up here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, so on and so forth. So they do swap back and forth between positive and negative values, but Right. Take a look at the direction of the points, the red points. Look at where they're headed. It looks like they're getting closer and closer to that zero to the x axis. Right. So let me go ahead and just for kicks and giggles. Right. Uh, I stopped at 15, but I'm going to go to 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Right. And you guys see that the values are getting smaller. They are getting smaller. Let me and look at they are getting smaller they're getting it looks like they're hugging that zero line right so we can sort of our gut feeling here is telling us that this sequence is going to converge to zero right now how do we show it and that's where we're going to use that theorem that's in yellow that's right above okay so instead of looking at the original sequence right we're going to look at the absolute value of a sub n, right? We're gonna look at this uh, sequence right here, absolute value of a sub n, right? And that sequence looks like this, right? Ln of two over one, Ln three over two, Ln of four over three, Ln of five over four, we're essentially Sort of throwing out, let me go, comma, dot, 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 dot. We are essentially throwing out the negative that's coming from the oscillation. And hopefully you guys see who the what the culprit is for that oscillation, that bouncing between positive and negative, positive and negative. It is the sine of 2n plus 1 pi divided by 2. That thing right there is what makes us oscillate back and forth between negative and positive, negative and positive. Okay. So Whenever you see something like this, the sine of some multiple of pi over two, um, uh, or I already showed you one of these at the very beginning of this section, when you have negative one to a power, right? And that one started to fluctuate back and forth between positive and negative, this sine uh, version does the same thing. So this is another one of the uh, culprits for having something that switches back and forth between a negative. Okay. There's a cosine one, which I think I have you guys doing one in the, uh, in the lecture questions down below. So whenever you see something like this in a sequence, right. And once we get into series, uh, whenever you see something that looks like this, you know that you're going to have something that's going to be bouncing around positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay. Now let's finish up this one. Okay. We still need to determine if this sequence is convergent or divergent, right? Instead of looking at the uh, sequence that bounces back and forth between positive and negative, positive and negative, we're going to be looking at the absolute value of the sequence, right? And the absolute value of the sequence, so this thing, a sub n, is divided or is de uh, defined specifically by the ln of the n plus one over n. This is all we need, right? So uh, the limit, this is what we're gonna have to sort of uh, find out. The limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n is equal to the limit 
as n goes to infinity, with the ln n plus one over n, right? This is something from Calc 1 that hopefully you guys remember. This is the ln of the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 divided by n. So we get to just look at this thing, right? So I'm going to break that apart. So I'm just going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 divided by n. This is the limit n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n. And if now you guys remember that thing, right? Since n goes to infinity, right, 1 over n, that goes to 0. Then this thing is equal to just 1. Now, not done yet, right? The n plus 1 divided by n goes to 1. So then therefore, all of this thing is going to be the ln of 1, which is equal to 0. So that means, right? Uh, I'm going to write it this way. A sub n converges to 0. So therefore, the original sequence, A sub n, the one with the alternating the one with the switching back between positive and negative, that goes to zero as well. Which makes sense because we just graphed it and lo and behold, right? That's where our sequence was going. That's where our points were going, okay? Awesome. Okay. Let's do a couple more definitions here. I'm defining them here. I'm going to make you guys do some stuff with them in the lecture questions. Um, these, uh, I've mentioned it before. I like pictures. So I'm going to explain the pictures. Okay. I'm going to explain the definitions. I'm going to use this area down here as sort of like a whiteboard to show you guys what uh, each one of these means. Okay. So suppose you had a sequence, right? And suppose you had and I'm drawing axes here just so that we can visualize, okay? There we go. Okay. Suppose you had a sequence, right? A sequence is what we call bounded above, right? If there exists a real number m such that all of your sequence lies below it. So basically saying, right, something that's bounded above means it's basically sort of like a magical line, right? And that's my value M, where all of my sequence sort of just happens below it. It doesn't have to get close to it, right? It just, my whole entire sequence happens below it. That's it, that's all. Okay, same idea if you have something that is bounded below. So if there's the magical line, right? And that's M, right? And your entire sequence happens above that point or it happens above that value, right? Then you have something that is what's called bounded below, okay? Almost done. I know this section is long. Anything that is either bounded above or bounded below, we just call it a bounded sequence. That's it. Okay. So if it's bounded above or below, we just call it bounded. Okay. Okay. A sequence is increasing, right? Is uh, increasing if as you let n get bigger, your sequence values get bigger than the ones before it. Specifically, it has to get bigger than the one that came directly before it. So, and it's just in case, let me, let me restate that really quick. Yeah, a sequence is increasing, right? If there exists a positive integer n sub zero, such that for all n bigger than it, it's uh, the terms, right, 
are bigger than the one that came before it, right? So what that basically means is this, and this is the part that trips people up. If there exists a positive integer n such that the right? So that's the part that trips people up. What that is saying, right, is the beginning n sub zero term. So it can do whatever it wants, right? It can do whatever it wants up to n sub zero, right? But then after n sub zero, it starts to get higher and higher and higher. So every subsequent value is bigger than the one that came before it. Whenever you have something that does that, we call those increasing sequences, okay? Same idea for something that is decreasing, right? So notice it has the same, same sort of language, right? If there exists a positive integer n sub zero such that that happens, right? Same idea. The beginning couple of values in my sequence, it can do whatever the heck it wants. We don't care, right? But there's gonna be an n, whoops, wrong kind of n, n sub zero such that after that point, it just starts to drop, okay? Whenever you have a sequence where the next term is smaller, than the one that came before it, you have something that's decreasing, okay? And then the very last term that I wanna define, at least for this section, is something that is monotone. Anything that is increasing or decreasing, it doesn't matter which one, right? Anything that is increasing or decreasing, uh, we call it just a monotone sequence or a monotone increasing or a monotone decreasing sequence, okay? But it basically means the same thing. It's some. It's a sequence that's either increasing or decreasing at some point, okay? Now, the reason why we need to cover those is because of this, the monotone convergence theorem, okay? So let me read it out first. If a sequence A sub n is a bounded sequence and there exists a positive integer n sub naught such that a sub n is monotone for all values greater than that n sub naught, then a sub n converges. That sounds very mathy. But remember, I like pictures. So uh, what I wanna do for this one to sort of illustrate the fact, right, is uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use bounded above and monotone increasing, okay? So for this particular example, I'm gonna say bounded above, right? And monotone increasing, right? So let me go ahead and dissect this a little bit and I hope you guys are following along here, right? So suppose you had a sequence that is a bounded sequence and it's bounded above, got it? That it's bounded above, so that means There's like this magic line that goes straight across where your sequence is not gonna get any higher than that, right? Cool? Okay. So you know that it's bounded above. There's a maximum value, right? That your sequence is bounded by from above, right? The second part of this theorem says that your sequence, a sub n, is monotone. And in the case of my picture, it is increasing. Right, so it's monotonically increasing. That means uh, there comes a point, right, where every subsequent value is bigger than the one that came directly before it. So I'm gonna use the same stuff that I've been doing in the definition above, right? The first couple terms, it can do whatever it wants, right? But there comes a point, n sub naught, where after that point, all the points are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? If they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? But they're bounded above by that value M, right? Then you guys hopefully see what's happening here. It is converging. Those dots are getting closer and closer to that M, right? 
You guys see why I like the pictures? There you go. Okay, the same argument works for the opposite direction. So if a sub n is a bounded below sequence, right? If you have a sequence that is bounded below and you have something that is monotonically decreasing, right? Then the same conclusion can be made. It's going to be converging to that minimum value, whatever that is, okay? There it is. There it is. Okay. I believe that is it, isn't it? Because lecture, yep, lecture questions. Use the Desmos calculator as much as you can. Uh, it's not a entirely formal proof uh, or an entirely formal argument for what we're going to be doing uh, maybe in the next two weeks. However, it is a really good source of sort of just a gut feeling of what your sequences are gonna do, okay? So don't hesitate on just using it just to get yourself the idea, maybe uh, while you're doing the problem, right? And say like, you plug it into Desmos and you see it converge into something. Okay, you know that this looks like it's gonna be a convergent sequence. So how do I figure it out so that I can show that it is converging, right? Okay, that's what I want you to use it for. Okay, um, just to get yourself that, that good gut feeling, okay? All right, uh, besides that, I have my office hours. You guys can come visit me. Uh, I have my all day Friday hours or just drop me an email and uh, I'll get, uh, get back to you guys whenever I can, okay? Besides that, I am done here. Happy studying.